Welcome to this episode of Revolution and Ideology. I'm Nick. Jared. In this episode, we are talking about Max Weber's concept of power. So we've talked about Weber at least once on the channel before. We did a pretty long episode on his uh, Protestant work ethic and the spirit of capitalism. Uh, that was just an audio episode where we went through his book, basically the entire book and the ideas that are contained uh, within there. Um, we've even talked briefly about Weber's definition of the state um, in one of our episodes. That wasn't us together, though. That was just me talking about the state. Uh, and we'll actually talk about that again in a second. But what we want to talk about today is Weber's concept of power. And this is, aside from the other two things that we've already talked about, Protestant work ethic and his definitions of the state, this is like the third thing that he is really, really, really famous for. In fact, Weber's definition of power, which we'll get to in a second, is probably by far the most cited definition of power that's used in a variety of disciplines from political science to sociology to psychology to so on. You get the idea. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. We're really going to go through, we're going to talk about his definition of a state because that gives us an idea of how he thinks about power. Then we'll talk about power, uh, domination, and authority, which are really the big ideas for Weber as it comes, uh, when it comes to power. Anything you want to add before we get started? I'm excited to learn from you this time because I, I use Weber's Protestant work ethic a lot in my American history classes mm -hmm. to talk about the birth of like puritanical like capitalism and things yeah. along those lines and how that's kind of founded in the East Coast of, of the United States and apply it to history. But that's kind of where my Weber stuff ends. So I'm actually excited to learn a little bit more about him. Cool. Um, so we're going to start with his definition of the state. Um, and I'm going to read that just briefly and that will give us an idea, like I said, of where he's coming from. This comes from his lecture slash essay that he gave in Munich in 1919, if you really cared, called Politics as Vocation. Uh, we'll post a link to that overall in the show notes. So he says, a state is a human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. Note that territory is one of the characteristics of the state, Specifically, at the present time, the right to use physical force is ascribed to other institutions or individuals only to the extent to which the state permits it. The state is considered the sole source of the right to use violence. So the state is an entity that claims a monopoly on violence. The reason we're talking about this now when we're talking about Weber's concept of power is because this kind of gives us an indication of where Weber is coming from. For Weber, a state isn't a state because it governs a population and like tries to control individual behavior, which is what most definitions of the state involve, right? People say, well, the state is uh, this institution that governs people's behavior and the economy and so on. For Weber, it's not about the function of a state or the ends of the state. It is the means with which the state uses. So something is a state because it has a monopoly on the use of violence. So Weber is really focused on sort of describing and categorizing things based on their means and not their ends. And this is illuminated in his definition on the state. So like I said, it's not a state because it governs people. It's a state because it makes use of its monopoly on power. So it's the means instead of, or on uh, violence. It's the means instead of the end, which is important. Um, so when thinking about this perspective as it relates to power, it's really, really interesting because people commonly think of power as like, it's not tangible, but it's like this thing that exists that like is kind of up for grabs, that like it's something that someone or a group of people has over someone else or another group of people as a result of like physical circumstances, like you're bigger and stronger or social circumstances, like you have more resources or hierarchy in a society is organized in some kind of way. But Weber really focuses on kind of the way that power is used and really the basis for power itself. So it's not, he doesn't talk about how like people gain sort of hold of the power in society as if it's like a uh, like zero sum game. Like that's not what Weber is about. So like if it's, if it's, if it's financial or political power, this power, th those are just like measures that can lead to perhaps purchasing or influencing some sort of violent means, which is the yep. real measure of power in his mind. Is that what you're saying? So, 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 so like money, money yeah. equals power is, is something that we're kind of used to hearing in our mm -hmm. society, but money only equals power if we're looking at it through Weber's lens, because that money can buy 
or like by influence within that manipulation of like using violence on people. Right. Like you could buy literal weaponry for that, yep. or you can buy hire mercenaries to deal with with uh, disgruntled citizens or what have you. Exactly. Okay. But violence is only one part of the sort of power dynamics for Weber. The other one is legitimacy and authority. So to use your example of money, yes, you could use that money to buy resources, which could give you a monopoly on violence. But honestly, Weber would be more interested on how we have defined money in our society to represent legitimacy, where we think that like the elite in society that have the most money, somehow that is a le- le- they've got that in some legitimate way and their status as a result of their finances is legitimate in our society. So now we're speaking my language again back to the Protestant work ethic and how we view these people. Not only do they view themselves, but we view them as the quote-unquote elect Mm -hmm. and that they have, through their good work, their labor, they have achieved this status and the status is the measure of how elect they are. Right. Both for themselves so they can feel good about their their abilities or whatever it is or and for those around them so that they can have this sort of reverence. It's kind of like, I mean, it is. It's, it's It's a literal measurement of oneself against one's peers yep exactly okay and that's a perfect example of how it's ideological right we're beyond the like i don't know what we like we would use hobbes as an example of something or like the constant warfare of quote-unquote primitive man right we're past that now it's completely ideological that we view these people as better than because we have this symbol which is in our in this example right money right financial status right um yeah So there's an author, he's a professor of government at Cornell, although he's retired at this point, but his name's Norman Uphoff, and he has a really good, it's like a classic article on Weber and power. And he says, quote, Weber never says that power exists or even that it is a relationship. He defines it only as a probability. To be more specific, one must examine the bases of those relationships in which power is reported. So let's read Weber's definition of power. Like I said, this is probably the most famous definition of power that's used. Uh, all over the place in academia and beyond, and that will give us an idea. He says, quote, Power is the probability that one actor within a social relationship will be in a position to carry out his own will despite resistance, regardless of the basis on which this probability rests. So Uphoff really illuminates how power is a probability. It is a probability between two people or groups of people that one person or group of people will be able to carry out his own will in face of resistance by that other party or parties in this case. So it's a probability from a high probability to a low probability. And we would say that the more power, the discrepancies there are, the higher the probability that one person will get what they want out of this relationship. So in the case of the state that we're talking about here, that monopoly on violence or um, a disproportionate amount of wealth or Mm -hmm. political power obviously alters that probability in their favor. And that's where this comes from. 100%. Um, But Weber actually doesn't make use of the concept power in itself very much. He says there are problems with this term. And he says, quote, the concept of power is sociologically amorphous. All conceivable qualities of a person and all conceivable combinations of circumstances may put him in a position to impose his will in a given situation. So Weber himself says this is power. However, sociologically, it's really hard to make use of this term power because it's so, he uses the term amorphous or whatever the German for amorphous is, it's so ambiguous, we would have to consider, like he says, every single quality of a person and of some circumstances in order to try to conceptualize power like in some sort of manifestation. So in modern terms, it would be like gender, race, money, as we've already talked right. about, right? Physical stature, other statuses in Class society, and, yeah. and on and on and on. And it's basically impossible to do that. I pause on this one. We just did an episode on Foucault and governmentality yep. because this one really, really makes me think of Foucault and how he talks about capillary power structures, right? This is what Foucault is all about. And I didn't know this until I started doing research for this episode. Even when I researched Foucault, as much as I've researched him in the past, I didn't know that he actually um, speaks on Weber quite a bit, which is interesting to learn about. Uh, And there's an article that I use uh, in my class on this topic where where the author writes about Weber and Foucault's concept of power and how they, where they're similar and where they uh, differ, which is kind of interesting. 
So he says, this is power. However, the term power is so like ambiguous, it really doesn't make sense to even use it in a sociological context or really any context. So he further specifies a specific type of power, actually a basis on which power exists, which is domination. And so this is his definition of domination. And this is when he, what he's really famous for, in addition to the definition of power. He says, domination is the probability that a command with a given specific content will be obeyed by a given group of persons. The sociological concept of domination must hence be more precise and can only mean the probability that a command will be obeyed. So now we've, we've gotten even more specific. He starts with this general definition of power, and then he goes more specific to talk about domination specifically. And this is where we're talking about the basis on which power rests, this domination. And again, he says, it is the probability that a specific command will be obeyed. So now we're getting into Now, is that obeying. command have to be explicit or implicit, or does he bother? So, so, so rather than having somebody like literally barking orders at you, yeah. like a drill sergeant or something like that, could that command be implicit? Get a job, go to college, get, go into debt, follow yep. all the rules, like... Um, so it's funny that you bring that up because I wasn't even going to use these two terms, but he actually defines specifically discipline and obedience as mm -hmm. well. So let's do it since you brought it up because it'll answer your question exactly. Okay. Discipline is the probability that by virtue of habituation, a command will receive prompt and automatic obedience in stereotyped forms on the part of a given group of persons. The concept of discipline includes the habituation characteristic of uncritical and unresisting mass obedience. Sheep. Yep. So habituation that's discipline sheep, for Weber. But that Weber. still speaks to domination, mm -hmm. this most like verbose form of yeah. power that he's and talking Weber about. And Weber actually talks about extensively. We're not going to do it in this episode because right. like we could literally be here for hours. He talks about normative societies and mm -hmm. their power as well. So... Like, like what you say, if the norm is to get a job and participate in the system, then that would be a form of sort of implicit domination. Like you I mean, said, one right? would just argue those types of things are basically societal commands that have been, mm -hmm. in his terms, habituated. Yep. And honestly, at times, go against individuals' greater interest. They would want to resist against some of these, mm -hmm. but they are kind of forced not to, which is, I mean, that's the de definition then of domination, right? These exactly. people, you don't necessarily want to sit in a cubicle uh, filling out Excel spreadsheets for the next four decades, but many of us do. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's power. Yeah. Um, I also have a note in my notes here that there's a lot of Foucault here, too, in his definition of discipline, which if you know anything about Foucault or you watched our other uh, episode, uh, Discipline and Punish is by far his most famous work, and it, the whole thing is about discipline and punishment and so on. So just the fact that Weber here calls out discipline and provides this definition, I see a lot of Foucault in there, too. And I'll just read the third one since we're already talking about it. Obedience will be taken to mean that the action of the person obeying follows in essentials such a course that the content of the command may be taken to have become the basis of action for its own sake. Furthermore, the fact that this is taken is so taken is referable only to the formal obligation without regard to the actor's own attitude to the value or lack of value of the content of command as such. So you are fully obedient if the content of the command becomes basically your motivation for acting rather than sort of your, um, what do I want to say, obedience to the person giving the command, the command itself and the content of the command, you will follow basically blindly without any consideration of how it impacts you or your own attitudes right. or the value within the command. So Which is clearly hijacked by ideology in this case, mm -hmm. whatever era we're talking about, the ideology could be nationalism, it could be a, some sort of religion, it could be like that's, that's what he's talking about yep. right there. Exactly. Um, so let's go back to power, uh, or sorry, let's go back to domination, um, because I'm going to talk about kind of what we touched on before you brought up, but th his concepts of the state and power and domination bring up some interesting sort of possible relationships in a society because someone can dominate, right? They can be dominant. Domination can sort of rear its ugly head in two ways, either via authority, which we're going to talk about in a second at length, or via the use of violence, um, as described clearly in his definition of the state. He says, persons in authority invariably claim that they are the right and proper persons to be making demand upon the public and uh, that what they seek is fully legitimate. At the same time, if their commands are not obeyed, they reserve the right to use force mm -hmm. or to impose economic or social sanctions. That's actually Uphoff, that's not Weber, but you get the idea. So 
you can either have a legitimate authority, which we're going to describe later in just a second, or you can use violence. So with just these two variables, we can think of all kinds of different situations in any society where, like, if the state or the individual that represents the state has basically complete legitimacy where no one questions their authority, then they would very clearly have zero reason to make use of force or violence. However, if many people in a society question the legitimacy of a state or a state actor, then they are going to have much more reason to make right. use of force to make people obey their commands. So I like to think of it kind of like it's this scale, right, from like completely legitimate to slightly less legitimate or perhaps illegitimate. But as long as you maintain a monopoly on violence in his definition of the state, then you can still dominate, right? There can still be domination and power discrepancies in any society. Um, this makes me think a lot about like social change and when social change comes into being, whether it's challenging the legitimacy of a state or a state actor or attempting to gain the monopoly on the use of violence and so on. But we could go on that for a really, really long time. Yeah, what it got me to think about was ob obviously the there's the mo or, mo more or overt versions of policing regarding like social movement, but there's also like the even more problematic use of policing for those that aren't necessarily like challenging the state, but seeking to go outside outside of dominance and power to achieve whether it is political or economic ends mm -hmm. like those people that are seeking we we call them to be blunt criminals but that's just yeah. them in a different way choosing to resist and of course the state using its monopoly of power mm -hmm. to impose its views exactly okay then he gets to the three pure types he calls them of authority or legitimate domination there's actually in scholarship some debate on the actual translation of the German word that he was using, um, whether or not he actually meant this was the only form of legitimate domination or there's illegitimate domination, whatever. That's beyond the scope of this um, episode. But we're just going to go with these are the three types of authority according to Weber, and these are famous. The first one is rational or legal authority. He says, resting on a belief in the legality of enacted rules and the right of those elevated to authority under such rules to issue commands. Legal authority. In the case of legal authority, obedience is owed to the legally established impersonal order. It extends to the persons exercising the authority of office under it by virtue of the formal legality of their commands and only within the scope of authority of the office. So legal, rational legal authority is people having authority, but only as a result of the position that they hold, that the authority is really given to the system itself, and that the system and the individual in this case in this position only is able to dominate because of people being obedient to the system itself. We could use the best example of this is like it's less so now with the current uh, president because we'll get to that in a second under charismatic authority but it's the president of the united states is the best example that usually people aren't like you don't obey an executive order from the president because of the president as an individual person right you obey that order because of the legal authority of the system and of the office which the president occupies. The same goes for like a governor in a state. The governor right. has the power to make an executive order. And for the most part, people will follow that executive order because they believe in the legitimacy, in the authority of the government itself, not necessarily the individual like person. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess what comes to mind is uh, being a history guy, I'm going to go back in time rather than pick on some recent executives. Let's go back to FDR and Executive mm -hmm. Order 9066, right, where that's an executive order. FDR himself is, as an individual, is is older and sickly and he's struggling a little bit. So it's not his order that gets, in this case, um, all of these, like, uh, uh, the military, really, to go around the country and round up people that are Japanese Americans and, and place them in these internment camps. Yep. It's not, it, no one's intimidated by FDR. It is the system and the authority. It's the system that grants him the authority that gets these individuals to go on um, basically this crusade to, again, wrap up, uh, 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 capture all of these Japanese mm -hmm. Americans and place them in camps, even though in many cases it probably went against their greater interest, certainly went against the, 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 the beliefs that they said they stood by. Yep. And yet it was that authority granted by the system. Perfect. I mean, I guess I repeated that twice, but you get what I'm saying. Perfect example. Like, that's, what, that's what I was thinking of. Perfect example. The second one, um, after rational legal authority, we have traditional authority. Weber says, quote, resting on an established belief in the sanctity of immemorial traditions and the legitimacy of those exercising authority under them. 
In the case of traditional authority, obedience is owed to the person uh, of the chief who occupies the traditionally sanctioned position of authority and who is within its sphere bound by tradition. But there, here the obligation of obedience is a matter of personal loyalty within the arena of accustomed obligation. So here he says authority, domination, is a result of a person, but a person occupying a position that has authority that is viewed as legitimate because it's basically existed since time immemorial. So this is sort of, I mean, he calls it tradition, right? This, is, this position exists and this person has power within this position because of the history of this position. Can you think of any examples of this? Like the, the history of the position? I mean, mm-hmm. any, any, I mean, we can look at any monarchy or dynasty, Perfect right? That's example. existed in like, the, like the, the, the Tang dynasty would be yep. a good example in China or something like that, where like you have this kind of like bloodline, right? Of, of moving from like emperor to emperor to emperor. At some point we run, the, the bloodline gets a little bit messy and we lose some heirs. And eventually we have like children ruling, right? In certain parts of these dynasties. And technically, I get it's like their viziers or their advisors mm-hmm. that are ruling in their name, or sometimes even their even their their mothers if there was like a harem in the in 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 the dynasty. But still, like that authority is driven not because that child emperor. Again, if we want to pick on some uh, some of the various Chinese dynasties over time, or some of the Middle Eastern dynasties over time, or some of the Southeast Asian dynasties over time, it's not that individual that where this authority. It's that bloodline. It's that mm-hmm. dynastic passing down of some sort of idealized notion of power. Yep. That leads to people subscribing to it. And again, like, they, they, and then they get to exert power over those people that are subscribers. Perfect yeah. example. He continues and says, authority will be called traditional if legitimacy is claimed for it and believed in by the virtue of the sanctity of age old rules and powers. The masters are designed according, or sorry, designated according to traditional rules and are obeyed because of their traditional status. You get the idea. And the third and final one is charismatic authority. He says, resting on devotion to the exceptional sanctity, heroism, or exemplary character of an individual person and of the normative patterns or order revealed or ordained by him. In the case of charismatic authority, it is the charismatically qualified leader as such who is obeyed by virtue of personal trust in his revelation, his heroism, or his exemplary qualities so far as they fall within the scope of the individual's belief in his charisma. Can you think of any examples of this one? Any of the populist leaders over time and space, mm-hmm. regardless of their political affiliation, although in my own personal like bias, I would argue many of these leaders end up being like problematic yeah. um, for a whole host of reasons. But yes, anybody that we would consider a populist leader, uh, and to give an easy example that's probably no longer controversial, Andrew Jackson was one of these these individual like populists that was able to use this charisma and this war hero moniker um, and this like every man fighting for the every man like basically political platform to achieve a lot of power and of course we already know the result of some of that power was um ethnic cleansing in the in the example of the, of the trail of tears which again mm-hmm. challenges the ideals on which one would argue that the united states was built upon but in this case this charisma over i don't know if the term i'm looking for is overwrites but somewhat overrules like people are lo- willing to look past that like yeah. go against their own morals and ethics to follow the charismatic power of this individual and your example is perfect because it really tells us that these three things can be combined sometimes, right? So like the Andrew Jackson example is perfect where he was incredibly charismatic and he was also, his authority was also resting in on the, the legal system. Yeah, in yeah the system. exactly. Uh, perfect example there. The other example for charismatic leaders that Weber talks about is religious leaders. Very clearly any like yeah. relig- religious or cult Cults. leader or anything yeah. like that, um, any of them, it re- it's a result of their uh, charisma. And then later on, like in modern religions, now it's a re- there we would call them traditional leaders. They have traditional authority because the system has existed for so long and so forth. So like the Pope, as an example, we would say now has authority based on tradition. Um, I guess I don't view popes as like overly charismatic, in, but like some. I mean, of them some are, of them I are. I mean, yeah. some of them. Uh, John Paul II, right? For like sure. Had, yeah. I mean. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Uh, so, like I said. Just a brief overview of Weber's concept of the state, which you can see more in uh, another one of our videos, power, domination, and authority. Super, super common, uh, really, really popular sort of typology of power and what it looks like. Um, Yeah, if you liked that, check out our other episode where we talk about Weber's Protestant work ethic and the spirit of capitalism, which he's also incredibly, incredibly uh, 
uh, famous for. We put we, that in the Myth is America series to tie it to like American economic development. So for I sure. Think, yeah. Yep. So we'll post a link to that as well. Uh, I'm Nick. Jared. Later.